We are now in public session. I invite the public into the gallery. Uh, everyone's welcome to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, I have to ask you to turn off your mobile phones and electronic devices with the exception of your tablets, which contain your electronic committee meeting pack. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with assembly recordings. The session has been recorded in video and audio and can be accessed by, by way of online stream lining either in the Assembly's website or on Democracy Live. And I can now move to item number one on the agenda. Apologies. As I referred to uh, earlier, our chairperson sends our apologies. Uh, are members aware of any other apologies? Paul Gervin, he possibly will be here, but apologies if he doesn't make it. Jim Wells. All right. Uh, agenda item number two, the minutes of the meeting of the 20th of January 2016. <coughs> Members, the minutes of the meeting of the 20th of January 2016 can be found on page six of your electronic packs. Are members content for these draft minutes to now be signed into the record? Great. There are no matters arising, so I can move on to item four on the agenda, and it's to, to do with correspondence. <coughs> correspondence received from the NAS UWT regarding continued suspension of a teacher. Members, at page 12 of your electronic packs, you will find a letter received on the 18th of January from the NAS UWT Teachers Union. The letter makes reference to a specific case involving the continued, continued suspension of a teacher and concern over the cost of the public purse over this suspension. Members, we have redacted any reference to the individual and the school in question. Members, can I remind you that we consider this general issue around the growing cost of precautionary suspensions within the education sector in our meeting on the 23rd of September last year, after correspondence received from the Irish National Teachers' Organisation. I can confirm that, as agreed, a letter has been issued uh, to the TOA requesting that further information be gathered and provided to us in order to consider if this is a wider issue across the whole public sector. A response from the Department of Finance and Personnel is due to be received no later than the 18th of February, and I suggest that once this information has been received, the committee can then consider if further action is required. In answer to Assembly questions on this issue, the Minister has confirmed that in the past five years there have been 123 suspensions at a cost of £4.2 million, resulting in just six dismissals. The average length of a suspension that has either started, finished or is ongoing is three years. In the particular case highlighted by the NAS UWT, a young teacher has been suspended since 2012. Given the seriousness of this issue and the cost of the public purse, do members agree that we write to the Department of Education Accounting Officer raising our concerns about the length of the suspensions, the cost of the public purse, and what action might be taken by the Department to address this issue with the employer's employing authority? The committee may also wish to ask if the particular case highlighted by the NAS UWT has been resolved. Do members agree that we copy the Committee for Education into this correspondence? Good. Except in our point, Chairman, if it was agreed, then <coughs> if it was resolved, why would they still be suspended? No, sorry, uh, you may have picked that up wrong. Uh, I th sorry? You, you said to write them to find out if this situation had been resolved. I, I presume you were talking about that case, no? Yes, yes, sorry. Yes. So if it was resolved, then they wouldn't have been 
writing to us to say that there's still an issue. Well, that's that's absolutely true. So there's no point in us writing to them to. <coughs> uh, <coughs> unless to have it formally, I suppose, noted that uh, it hasn't been resolved. But in a sense, we're we're writing knowing the answer. Yeah. As of today. We, we, we could write asking why the process is taking so long because you know we're not. It's not well, I think as a public accounts committee, our concern is not not in any individual case, but what's happening in general, and uh, and why uh, the process takes so long. Yeah. Now, the minister, of course, will point out that he's not the employing authority. That's the uh, that's the board of governors. But should that not go to the employing authority rather than going to the union, who's representing a member? I'm guided entirely by you know whatever members tell well, me. Well, I suggest, Mark, um, chairperson, that we write to the employing authority rather than someone who's actually representing someone in any particular case. Um, Chair, I think um, I've also been in correspondence with the department on this issue, and in addition to the committee getting correspondence, uh, unions have been writing to me. Uh, I wrote to the department in June last year with a list of questions. The reply came in to me and was side copied to the committee. And uh, it certainly had the effect of drawing the permanent secretary's attention to the fact there was a problem here and the scale of it. And uh, Paul Sweeney then, uh, in reply, said he had asked officials to review the department's current practice regarding monitoring of procedures across a range of dispute resolutions. So I think it was an acknowledgement, uh, you know, in general, uh, these cases were, were taken too long. Uh, I think there is a case then maybe for the committee going back to the department and really ask what, what, what has happened since, what progress has, has been made. Okay. Uh, sorry, Roy. Yeah. There was an indication that the department thought it wasn't their responsibility, it was the employment authority. Yeah. But would I be right in saying that the department will be paying the wages during all of this time? No. And therefore they should have an interest in ensuring that there are appropriate mechanisms in employment authorities? It's just the school budget pays for it, it's not the education. It's not the department pays for it. If, well, if they, ultimately, of it. they ultimately pay for it. There's also the issue then of in some cases, possibly substitute cover as well. Yeah, it comes out of the school budget as well. Mm. It comes out of the, the school. Which just means it's not available to spend on uh -huh. the classroom because it's been mm -hmm. spent. But, but they're an employing authority. They're given yeah. the budget to run, mm -hmm. and it's up to the, the governors of the school to decide how to do it. I'm not saying this is right, but I'm just saying we're going to pick someone to write to. Why would we write to a union who's representing an individual? We don't know the ins and outs of the case. If the education department are saying they're not the employing authority, then why do we not write to the employing authority? Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying don't do anything, I'm saying. Yeah. But my, my reason would be, I suspect it, it would be across all <coughs> employment authorities. Uh, sure, just on it, I'm surprised the NASUWT have, have written to us highlighting the fact that it is so difficult um, to actually dismiss a teacher. Uh, you know, if, it's, if they're saying the process has taken three years, they want them dismissed quicker because. That's what this, this committee be looking at. We'll be looking for more efficiency in dealing with this. Uh, if a teacher's f failing, um, then they should be dismissed I'm more sure quickly than, than, than three years. Uh, it, it, that process doesn't take that length of time. Uh, I'm not, I'm sorry, maybe I want to correct something. Uh, I, I, if I, I hope I didn't mislead you earlier. We're not writing to the union. We're simply establishing if that case was, was still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, but look. Uh, but they were indicating that an average has taken three years to dismiss teachers. And I know, um, certainly. In, in cases where, where teachers, particularly head teachers, are, are underperforming and underperforming badly, and you see a school falling apart, mm -hmm. there's little can be done to get them moved on. So you know, I, th I think the union have done us a, 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 a good turn in highlighting how difficult it is to to get rid of teachers who are performing badly. Uh, I think maybe just. Uh in, in response to a written question, it, it was disclosed that 106 teachers had been suspended. Uh, of those, only six were sacked. Uh, so one has to assume that the other five, five retired. So 95 teachers were reinstated. And but I think. Uh, the term is not being fair to We have to, sorry, 
Uh, we have to assume that the 95 were reinstated. Uh, uh, were reinstated correctly. Mm. Or, or the five that was retired could have been given out and a package rather than be dismissed. Yeah. They could have been given a half yeah. package to go. Well, look, the proposal, the proposal before you today is simply to write to the Department of Education, not to the union. Yes. And remember, our function here is purely to see that public money is properly spent. And the figures suggest that £4.2 million pounds, uh, suspending 106 teachers, where most of them are reinstated, is, may not be good value for money. But we're simply asking the questions. Uh, maybe I could ask for Kieran's advice, on this, perhaps, to keep it. Uh, no, I think the, our interest on yours, I think, is in the ge generic issue rather than yes. an, any specific case. Yeah. So uh, it's wrong for either us or the committee. We can't really get into the merits or otherwise of a particular case. But Absolutely. the process yes. is important. Uh, I think the big issue is the length of time the process is taken. I suppose for the, the union, it's more than one union of yes, of this. Yes, the ILTO was also involved. Uh -huh. uh, I should also say... Um, in the earlier correspondence, um, and you go back to what are the main reasons for suspension, uh, one of them obviously is child protection issues where um, obviously there has to be great caution. Uh, so if there are issues there, then and they don't stack up. Uh, it, it is important then that they're resolved quickly. Um, I'm not clear at all in many of these kids are on efficiency issues, but the original correspondence talked about, uh, you know, misconduct issues, child protection issues, or medical and health <coughs> issues. So it didn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that, uh, I think um, the teacher efficiency probably wasn't a, a big, a big <coughs> factor in in uh, the hundred odd cases that that surfaced. Uh, Chairman, if you were suggesting we're right the department, I'm, I mean, uh -huh. if you were suggesting that, I mean, I, I, you want to propose, I'd propose we go ahead and do that, speed us up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, or we'll take as you, long as the opinions take. Are you happy enough that we inform the NASUWD that that's the action we've taken? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for bringing our attention that it is a slow and protracted process. Um, but there may, of course, be, you know, there may be valuable uh, discoveries ar ar arising out of that. For example, uh, boards of governors or individual governors, while training on employment issues is offered, is not compulsory. Uh, and uh, it seems to me, perhaps, and, and I want to stay neutral on this, that if there's £4.2 million uh, going to suspend the teachers, uh, then it may be that if members of Boards of Governors uh, were uh, required to undergo training, then that figure might be reduced. And that's the only interest that public accounts would have in this issue, is ensuring that every pound that's allocated to mm -hmm. education actually is spent on children. I think Bert declared that as a governor of, of a primary school, and then primary school. But have you suspended uh, anybody? No, not that I can remember, but just put that on the record. But. Um, when deciding to suspend someone, governors would be taking it, taking advice and, and following their, their, their policies, mm. uh, and it's generally around safeguarding, as has been said. But it's the process they're in, which is it's the process. Uh, and I think, from memory, there were lessons from elsewhere. Maybe in a previous uh, assembly when I was on this committee about how in England we also turn up processes. Uh, speeded up that suspension period by forcing earlier decisions, getting gathering evidence Absolutely. closer uh, and a shorter time frame. So I think it's the process we should be. I think the time the I, process we should be. I've concentrating no, on. I don't want to preempt what comes out of this, but uh, I'm sure the member's absolutely right that it's about process, uh, and uh, I don't think we're querying teachers being suspended. It's just the fact that so many of them are suspended for two or three years, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's. I'm no, I don't think anyone. Would, ever attempt to justify that. I think the vast majority of them are not about child protection, uh, but they need to maybe say that. If it's child protection, clearly I don't think anybody would be questioning it at all. So if you're happy enough with that, we'll move on. Chairman, just given that Roy's declared notice, um, I'll declare notice in the 
Board of Governors, two schools. All right. But it's on the declaration. Okay. Well, I'm a Board of Governors of three schools, but there's no relevance. Well, just so I don't feel the need to declare an interest. I don't think it's just Roy has, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, correspondence received from an anonymous uh, whistleblower regarding a parades commission employee. Members of page 14 of your electronic packs will find a letter received on the 18th of January from an anonymous whistleblower regarding a parades commission employee. The letter identifies a public sector employee who they state has been seconded to the parades commission who subsequently left under VES in October. Uh, 2015. The letter alleges that the employee has now been re-engaged as a consultant to the Parades Commission. The letter raises concerns about the public sector employees leaving under, um, I suppose, voluntary exit scheme and then being re-employed again under consultancy roles. I take it members have grasped what that means. Kieran, do you have any uh, comment to make on this? Well, one? the letter has been sent to me as well. Right. So, um, and uh, we, I think we're, we're part of the voluntary exit scheme uh, by the end of this year, but 13 or 14 of our staff will go, one of which uh, was on secondment to the, the Parades Commission. Now, under the rules, uh, seconded staff are absolutely eligible. Um, and um, I think we have been in contact with the Parades Commission just to see what the story is. Our understanding is that the person had been, has been re-engaged for a short period of time to prepare accounts. That's our understanding. Now, we're not the auditors of the Parades Commission is uh, a reserved area, so we don't actually audit it. Um, so, uh, no, the generality of it is uh, if somebody is in the, uh, the civil service pension scheme and they uh, the go out and voluntary exit, there are quite strict rules if they're re-employed with any public sector employer that's in that civil service pension scheme, then would have to pay uh, money back so, uh, if, if, uh, up to a period of six months. So that's the rules as, as sit. Uh, when we're looking at this, we find that there is a weakness in the scheme rules, uh, uh, and it's a weakness that not just doesn't exist here, it's also in England. So that, um, well, a member of staff can't be re-employed in uh, another public sector organisation immediately uh, if they're in the civil service pension scheme. But well, there was nothing to stop somebody going then to another public sector organisation that's in a different pension scheme. Uh, that's something that the, the administration in Whitehall is actually looking at at the minute to actually close that gap. So there is an issue there. Obviously, uh, it's something uh, you know that it begins the spirit of scheme rules for to have reemployment as. Either consultants or, or, or anything else, and it's something we have looked at in other other contexts. So that, that's all I can tell you about the the, the case at, at the minute. So, uh -huh. does someone anyone to? Yeah. Yes. Just, I mean, yeah. We've had an issue of revolving door stuff before. Yes. Uh, before I was on the committee again, but uh, uh -huh. I think you're quite correct that it's against the spirit of the scheme, which is about. Uh -huh. uh, making savings in the public mm -hmm. sector and then perhaps allowing as employment opportunities arise for their employment opportunities mm -hmm. for people to come into the, the public sector. So I think it is uh, a matter that we would be wanting to bring to the attention of the Minister for Finance and we'd be asking them to, mm -hmm. you know, to liaise if there are, uh, it's already been looked at in Whitehall to see if there are any lessons that have been learned there already, but certainly it's, it's very much against the spirit of what the VAS was about. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, um, thank you, uh, uh, Edwin, I think yep. first. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a, a, in, in terms of this, um, I think it's a very interesting one, and I suspect it's probably not the only one. And, you know, there's no point in putting up public money to reduce the amount that we're actually spending on a recurrent basis if people are going to be sneaked in by the back door. I think we need to lay down a very strong marker that, that it isn't a tolerable situation where mm -hmm. you know someone can can walk out of a job, get a handout, 
get their pension and then be paid in, in, in a ruse um, as such um, to be a consultant. That's, that's not acceptable and I, th I think that you know, we need to be addressing this with whoever to indicate that there's no acceptability about this, not just with the Braids Commission. As, as I say, I suspect that there's others are at it as well. And if people are, are stepping down from this uh, civil service work, it's up to them to find uh, work elsewhere. The civil service should be making the reductions and making the savings. Mr. Hussey. Thank you, Chair. Clearly, I, mean, I, I fully accept what's been said. If somebody, though, for example, were to step down from the civil service under the, the scheme and get a job with the district council, for example, it's a different employer, but it's still government to a certain degree. But that's not obviously within this, but it's still, you know, it's a bit grave, if you ask me. Well, that's exactly the point I'm, I'm sort of raising. Um, so somebody could theoretically leave the civil service today, um, get a job in a council tomorrow under a different pension scheme, and they wouldn't have to pay anything mm. back. So that's exactly the issue that's been looked at in, in Whitehall. There's, there's also the issue if, I mean, if this person has been re-engaged as a consultant, mm -hmm. it suggests that that expertise is now been lost to the Parades Commission, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps there was a gap there to fill. But they have the ability to tell a person they're not letting them go in the VES if, yeah. if their skills are going to leave a significant gap. Oh, no, no, I need to correct you on that. That was our call uh, because uh, we are the employer of the person, so the person is seconded to the Parades Commission. Right. Uh, so they're our employee, so they're off our permanent books. Right. They just happen to be seconded to the Braids Commission. Mm -hmm. But the Braids Commission have re-employed them as a consultant? Uh, well, so we understand, yeah. So, so the Braids Commission couldn't have stopped them leaving because they were your employee? Yes. Right, that's so, fair. So, uh, I, think, that. I think it's very important to clarify yeah, no, that. Except that in this case, but it, uh -huh. it is also the case in general terms in this scheme, this might be an anomaly in that mm -hmm. the person was seconded over to another area, that mm -hmm. a, a department or a public sector body doesn't have to allow the person to go, so therefore uh -huh. it, it may be different, different in this case because they have no uh -huh. control over it, but uh -huh. if, the, if a gap's created by them, then we, we don't want to get into this situation where... Uh, departments or public sector bodies come and say to us, well, we had to fill that gap so that, that they were the person well, you would base. They, they don't let them go in the first place. Well, I'll just give you a bit more insight to that. Uh, uh, comments are short term, so this was a, a two year secondment, December 13 to December 15, with the option of a further year. So, um, let's say if the option wasn't going to be exercised, they'd be coming back to us anyway, and at the very latest, they'd be back to us in, in 12 months. So off our permanent payroll. Yeah. Well, should the Trades Commission budget not be cut in association with that? You know, if if if, if they were previously employing that individual, uh -huh. and that individual goes out in VES, should their books not reflect that that they no longer get that, that source of income because th that has been decided well, that well, it wasn't required? No, 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 no. They weren't required for us. Um, so they're off uh, your books then? Yeah. They're off our books. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and there's no question that puts a, coming back to puts a different perspective on it. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Trevor? Mm -hmm. There's lots of rights and wrongs. Parade commissions are wrong on its own right, but that's a different story. <laughs> but taking up your point about the VES and the anomaly in the system, mm -hmm. a lot of people were sceptical that many wouldn't apply, but many did. Mm -hmm. Oversubscribed. Many of them will be in the understanding and maybe will be re-employed in other areas, such as the Commission. Where is their position going to stand if this anomaly is fixed, given that whenever they left they knew they could do something? Are they currently going to be forced out of employment because someone got it wrong? Uh, that's one I can't caught whether there was um, any, you know... It's, uh, well, I mean, Whitehall got it wrong, you're saying so. Oh, well, no, that, that, that's always been the case. There's always been these sort of anomalies in, in scheme rules. And this is something that Whitehall is currently, currently looking at. Um, I think it's wrong for anybody to leave. Uh, I think this is a key point, uh, that anybody would accept severance in the expectation that they could get through and be re-employed through a back door. You know, that, that wouldn't be right. I'm not saying that it is right, but what I'm saying is... Uh -huh. There's, they would be of the understanding if they know some of their friends and colleagues have got jobs, 
back in other parts of the public sector. Mm -hmm. That I thought the loopholes closed now. But whenever they took their or applied for their voluntary severance, knowing that they could do this, uh -huh. then would it be equally right for them to stop them from applying to those jobs? No, I think um, once people leave, uh, they, you know, it's, it's a free market out there. Yeah. Once they leave, they, they're entitled to apply for whatever. Uh, if they apply back into the civil service, uh, the, the, they would have to pay back everything. Uh, so if it's within 28 days, they would have to pay everything back, and then a sliding scale up to uh, six months. I thought you said earlier if it was someone who operated on a different pension scheme. Ah, well that's, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, okay. but if they were in a different pension scheme, they wouldn't have to pay anything back. Yeah. Just to tease Timbers. out now even further, Chairman, uh -huh. if someone left the civil service and applied for a job in a health trust, would they have to pay it back? No. But sure, that's, that, that's, that's outrageous because it's all coming from the public purse uh -huh. at that point. you know. That, that said, uh, in the generality of it, um, health trust. Every, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. No, but the health trusts are paying off people. They're part of the VS. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. As are the education board. Yep. You know, this is about reducing the, the burden on the public purse. Mm -hmm. So, what's to stop there being a, a, a revolving door merry go round where someone in the civil service takes the money and then applies for a job and gets public money? Um, through the health trust or the education board, um, then someone else who's an education board, they take the money and apply for a job in the civil service and so forth. You know, there, there, there's a potential for a major farce share. But the, uh, health, the health trust budget would have been reduced as a result of the VES that they were undertaking. So if they were advertising for a job, it would be a job, you know, outside of the VES. Mm -hmm. Their headcount would have reduced by the amount of VES. But should the individuals not have, to, if it's public? If it's a publicly funded position, should they not have to hand the money back? Well, well that's the, what, uh, what the system's currently looking at. Yeah. Members, can uh -huh. I, maybe can I encourage you to uh, sort of move this forward? Uh, Kieran has indicated that Whitehall's looking into this. I think I have a proposal that we write to our own Minister for Finance and Personnel. Are you content to leave it at that? Great. I think we just need to alert them and also maybe for them to do a trawl across the civil service to see are there any other examples of this? Because it, it may be, I think as Edwin has said, I think it's a practice then which actually undermines the whole rationale of the VES. That's, that's uh, useful and I think perhaps we could uh, indicate that in the letter <coughs> to the General Minister. For uh, <coughs> I, I have also a commitment uh, to do a study in VES uh, which will look at how successful the scheme has been in meeting its objectives uh, and the sort of issues we've talked about today then we can... Thank you flag those up. Do we copy to the committee also for finance and personnel? Read. We'll move on then to another piece of correspondence, and uh, the chairperson will be familiar with this one, uh, from Professor Austin Smith regarding <coughs> proposed timetable changes uh, by Irish Rail. Members at page 16 of your electronic facts, you'll find a letter received on the 18th of January from Professor Austin Smith regarding Irish Rail consultation on train service between Belfast and Dublin and the future of the cross-border enterprise service. I understand that the DRD, uh, that DRD are currently looking into this matter and received a briefing from TransLink at their meeting this morning as the DRD committee. I can I suggest members that the clerk contacts the Regional Development Committee to receive an update on the outcome of the briefing. Agreed. Uh, are members I content? Say, I, I mean, I met the Chief Executive of TransLink on Monday in relation to that line because there's issues around your East Station, but I got an assurance from them that the enterprise timetable wasn't changing and the only possible uh, alteration on was to facilitate a dark service in, in Conley Station in the morning. It might be a slight alteration of a few minutes, but so it, it contradicts uh, that right. But I think but you're no, correct. No, no. Regional Development Committee should have a look at it. No, no, it's the Chair of Regional Development. But the initial issue was that there was a new timetable produced that was going to affect it, which instigated obviously this professor. And to be fair to the Chief Executive of TransLink, he was onto it right away as well. So you're right what you're saying, but initially. Irish Rail had come up with a new timetable mm. that was going to dramatically affect the enterprise yeah. service for people leaving from Belfast. Oh, okay, fair enough. Uh, anyway, I think the, the meeting this morning, as a fair chairperson to say, was a very positive one, and there are significant, uh, I think, uh, 
avenues of discussion that is now taking place that will <coughs> perhaps avoid a situation where a timetable drafted in Dublin was imposed mm. without any real serious consultation. That's Dublin all over much. Yeah. Dublin rule. Uh, 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 <laughs> Do members agree to write back to Professor Smith thanking him for his letter and advising him the recent development committee are currently in the matter? Uh, he was, in fact, at the committee meeting this morning. Members, at page 25 of your electronic patch, you will find an email received on 21st of January from David Hutchison, former head of land and property in the House and the executive. Members, can I seek agreement to note this correspondence and consider it in more detail when we consider the issues paper in closed session? Okay. Can I move on to item 5 on the agenda? Uh, inquiry into invest to save funding in Northern Ireland. Uh, yes, uh, we'll change the bottom table. <coughs> At page 33 of your electronic packs, you will find a copy of the Audit Office's report into invest to save funding in Northern Ireland. At the page 110 of your electronic packs, you will see a briefing paper has also been provided. Here, I would like to welcome you and your team to the committee today. Could I now ask you to give us a short introduction to your, uh, to your briefing on the Invest to Save funding in Northern Ireland in public session before we move on to a full briefing in closed session? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my colleague Eddie Bradley was leading on this, so I will pass straight over to Eddie. To Take you through the, okay. the report. Okay, thanks, Kieran. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, just by way of background to the scheme, um, this was very much an executive-led strategy, which was established in 2010. The primary focus of the scheme, as the name suggests, was the delivery of savings within the budget period, uh, particularly cash-releasing savings. And there were actually three separate invest to save schemes uh, delivered um, over the five years from 2010 to 2015. Over that period, just over £300 million was allocated to 31 projects. Um, eventually, £254 million of that money was actually spent. Um, Again, just for your information, the Invest to Save funding was ring-fenced, and that's quite important. It therefore shouldn't have been used for any other purposes other than Invest to Save projects. Um, one of the things we did was look at Invest to Save schemes elsewhere, particularly in England and Wales. And I suppose just what our experience from reviewing that information was that their schemes we're maybe more focused on stimulating innovation in service delivery, supporting joined up working across departments and cross-cutting initiatives, and encouraging and promoting managed risk taking. Um, so I just give you that by way of context um, to what our Invest to Save scheme focused on and how schemes elsewhere operated. In terms of what we found, a um, couple of uh, key points. Over £300 million was allocated, but only £254 million was actually spent on Invest to Save projects. The big underspend was actually a result of the Department of Health reallocating these ring fence funds to other areas within its own baseline. So, although this money was supposed to be ring fenced, um, it wasn't used um, actually for invest to save purposes. DFP wasn't aware of this uh, reallocation of money at the time, um, and this was only discovered actually during the course of our audit. Um, I think what we found over the course of the three separate invest to save schemes was that the selection process of individual projects wasn't always clear, it seemed to be quite inconsistent across the different schemes. And it was quite difficult to distinguish between invest to save, ring fenced funding, and conventional mainstream public expenditure. I 
think key, despite the focus of the scheme on delivering savings, um, an awful lot of the projects actually didn't deliver any savings. Uh, over a third of the projects we looked at didn't make any estimate of what savings they were going to um, deliver, and they didn't offer any forecast of savings. Uh, no savings targets were set for the scheme as a whole. Uh, there was no monitoring or reporting of savings for the scheme. We asked departments to give us their estimates of the savings which they generated. On the basis of what came back to us, and I would just caution that not everything came back in the same format, um, about £150 million pounds of savings were estimated up to March 2015. Um, so again, just to remind you, that's in the context of a funding envelope of £300 million. Pounds. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of the overall objective to deliver savings over the three-year period of the, of the um, budget, whether that was done or not. Two-thirds of the savings were actually related just to six projects, so the savings were concentrated mainly on projects which were to do with voluntary exit type of schemes, um, and that included um, the health area and education, and also the planning service, I think, had quite a, quite a big scheme. Um, a big tranche of the savings, which was claimed, over 40 million, um, it was actually in relation to DARD, and it was EU fines which were avoided, rather than actual savings in the baseline. And around half the projects which were funded didn't claim any savings figures at all. So trying to just step back from that, I think you know, we, we wouldn't question the merits of individual projects which were funded. It's just whether, whether those projects were actually invest to save type projects is probably the question for the committee to explore. Um, in the absence of overall monitoring and reporting of outcomes and savings, there's a clear risk that Overall, the Invest to Save scheme didn't actually deliver the financial savings which it uh, set out to achieve. Um, I think one of the things, and this is maybe for the, the committee's um, consideration, our view was Invest to Save was really an opportunity to do things differently, to pilot ex new exercises, to encourage transformation, to encourage risk-taking and innovation. And I think from our review of the scheme, there's little evidence that this really happened in practice or that that opportunity was maximised. Um, I think, Chair, that, that's sufficient for public uh, session just to give a flavour of the report. All right, members, for the remaining item of business, uh, is it, uh, sorry, it's necessary that we move into closed session. Are members content that we now move to closed session? Agreed. Sure, if I could withdraw from the meeting because I think there's quite a bit relating to health. So, If I could withdraw from the meeting because there's sure. quite a bit of related to health. So. <coughs> this is the Northern Ireland Assembly.